Hello everyone, welcome back to the Ashara Karate in Singapore channel and welcome back to part 2 of our reaction video to our experience in Japan. If you want to know how we reacted to the first part of the video, go back to the first part of the video. And in the second part, we are going to be sharing our experiences, our reaction to the second half of training, which is the technical practice as well as sparring. <laughs> Yeah, the gentleman who's practicing with Cheryl right now, he is also he also has his own dojo where he teaches that. Fun fact, this guy brought us to Fantastic Ramen after training. And we had a little scuffle because we were <laughs> challenging each other on who should pay. No, I say it's not that we refuse to pay, it's more of like I pay, no I pay, you know, kind of situation. Do you find the format of the class easy to follow? So the earlier segment here was running through a uh, control of competition. Uh, there was some clever fighting stunts and then the stunts. So, uh, that one mentally I had to, I had to like, try to flip the movements along and not flip the fighting. Uh, but I think the general flow was quite okay because he was uh, focusing on the drills a lot. Uh, the techniques were not too complicated, at least for uh, our level. Uh, I can't say the same for, I'm not, I'm not sure about how the junior else is feeling about the combinations. Okay. Yeah. But I thought it was actually quite manageable for an advanced class. And here we have moved on to kumite or sparring. So one thing I note about sparring in the Ashara circles is that some dojos still use the old format of sparring, which is the what we call the old Kyokushin rules which is no punches to the face, but anything uh, punches any, anywhere below the head is okay. Kicks, you can kick anywhere you like. Uh, some dojos have adopted face punches also. So I know in Singapore, we practice mostly with um, the face punches on. And to, to me, this affects my training quite significantly because Later when you watch me do sparring, I tend to prefer to stay at a longer distance because I subconsciously always feel that the hand is gonna come to my face. But a lot of the guys who are used to, you know, the no punches to the face, they like to fight a lot closer. It's good that I said, then the negative try to get to do a bit more. So, try to do more, try to talk, understand more. Yeah. Not just keeping touch. Yeah, and this is one of the things with Asha Karate practice, right? When it comes to sparring, it's not so much about how much you can hit the other person or, you know, how strongly you can hit the other guy it's more of how well you can control your opponent you sometimes see that they will deliberately let you punch and kick and all that only to find a good uh, time to break your balance and then follow up right after so the training emphasis is a little bit different it's about looking to control the other person that's number one and number two depending on who you're pairing up with so for instance if you're pairing up with a junior belt or if you're pairing up with kids the training emphasis is more of your personal fitness in your technique you shouldn't be hitting hard but rather you should think about how you can control the other person with the least force possible and then of course if you're matched with somebody who is on par with you then you can go ahead go ahead and have fun for Elwin, do you find the way they do sparring over here different from how we do it in Singapore? Or as compared to whatever else you have seen? I'm, I'm actually trying to look at the senior belts now. And I think 
they're not going heavy so I, I like that la. so a lot of um, care when it comes to sparring with partners um, but they, I think they try to be quite precise with what they do like they're not going to throw a very hard kick or a strong punch but they will make sure that it makes a point that hey, it will hit you or it will connect you need to guard you need to maybe do something more you need to block better or you need to make sure your guard is up you need to maybe make sure you are more precise as well because if it's just throwing punches and kicks I think they they are quite unfazed by by ineffective techniques la. so I think the emphasis is on um, quality movement sharper techniques or more precise techniques impact point and, and, and what not just to make the whole sabaki technique work a little bit better I think because it, it changes so I'm trying to see different people at the same time and one thing I appreciate uh, training in Japan or rather every time I go to visit a dojo in Japan is people are generally not shy to give you comments about how you can improve especially like if you're off in terms of your technique they will just tell you uh, you know out of, out of their goodwill to want to see you improve right and if you make a good effort they will just say oh and you know acknowledge how was the rotation done do you all just switch random partner or you're going clockwise somebody stays or something like that I think at first there was a set rotation but the, the point is to make sure that you have partner with everybody yeah? But they, they generally take the initiative to look for different partners. Yeah. I think that's very good. Sometimes I think our students sometimes might be too shy and then yeah. needs to warm up to this practice of, of rotating different partners or, or not sticking to somebody you know all the time. And this is one of the cultures that I appreciate uh, in the Japanese dojos, right? People take initiative to want to train and that includes, you know, finding people that you have not trained with before, test them out, see how you match up against, against them and stuff like that. You know, as compared to sometimes uh, locally, like what Elwin say, people are too shy to move around or they just stand and wait for instructions and wait for what you say. Which is okay to be shy, I guess, but you know, it will be a lot more value added to your learning experience if you are a bit more proactive. Yeah, I, what, <clears throat> what I see across the different belts, right? It's like, you know, there's that sincerity in terms of practice because everybody like has this mindset I'm there to train I'm there to learn so I need a partner I want to find a partner I have to find a partner and then they move fast they change fast they switch fast and, and, and there's very little time wastage in between transitions I, I would say it seems that way lah. so I remember this uh, gentleman uh, very well because the last time I was here I also practiced with him yeah, he is quite good actually moves quite fast, uh, very light on his feet. And this is me going with a beginner. I know there's a whole bunch of you, especially those who have yet to start martial arts or karate, that you don't like the idea of training with kids, but actually training with kids is a good opportunity for you to, again, be more precise with your technique without using a lot of force. Because one of, the, one of my beliefs in martial arts training is that if you're going to learn how to use a technique and you need to use a lot of power and strength in your technique, then there is not much point of that technique in the first place, right? So it's a great opportunity to polish up on the, you know, the precise points of what makes the technique works by training with children. And then these few clips, you start to see us pairing with some of the more veteran participants right they might look bulky to you and they might look old to you but they are very light on your feet <laughs> i know this guy is like very hard to move actually <laughs> 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 
The guy I'm pairing up uh, with right now, he is actually the branch chief for this dojo. So Fujioka Sensei is not a branch chief. Uh, he's the lead instructor, but this guy is actually the branch chief. He's yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's probably about 30 seconds. Like. They emphasize more on the rotation. Yeah, make sure that everybody has a chance to go with uh, other people. Yeah, that's one of the nice things about sparring without headgear and not hitting the face. The movements are a bit more continuous. Uh, people wait less because they worry less about getting punched in the face. So it's a different kind of training, different kind of game altogether. I thought that's a good point. I think, you know, there are some people out there who say that if you don't train head attacks, like, it, it, it devalues the art or something. But I think what we, what we see here is that there are benefits to both face punching, sparring, and then those that without. It's just a matter of how you balance it out and where what is your focus and what is your emphasis and that you you keep trying things out not both ways and all that yeah 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 <laughs> i've never worn boxing gloves in singapore it's like so foreign to me what is the standard uh um fist fist guard is it that they are supposed to be wearing like is it the mma gloves that Generally speaking, but you do see some of the other participants wearing boxing gloves, so I guess it's up to them from the looks of it. Back in the early 90s, or even the early 2000s, or even way before that, uh, people don't really like to wear protective equipment because they feel it's not a macho thing to do. But when you do put it on, you practice with a lot less injury and that also means that you can continue practicing without taking you know an injury break so your relative progress is much faster than if you get injured you pause for a while and then you go back to training why oh, you paired up with Fujioka Sensei on the earlier round too? Uh, uh, it's encouraging you to attack more, probably. Okay, so cooling down after practice. So this is part of the standard uh, warming up routine. So it's just that Sensei takes this part as a cooling down routine instead. And in this part, Sensei say, Rush son, would you like to give a speech <laughs> to the whole class? I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> so they're laughing because all I said was, uh, thank you for inviting us for this session. It was a lot of fun. That's it.
And then I felt bad and came out again to say that, okay, if you're in Matsuyama in November, we plan to go there for the tournament. So hope to see you there. But yeah, a, a lot of the communication um, in Japan, if you don't speak Japanese, it's going to be through body language, through gesturing. And if you have your phone with you, it's going to be through Google Translate. Somehow uh, things will work. You will communicate. And I don't know, like the Japanese, they are not awkward to just communicate with you despite not being able to speak your language, right? So I definitely uh, encourage you to still go even though you don't speak the language. But of course, if you speak the language, no matter how little, it's going to be useful. Do you know how it works? They, they go down the line, is it? To greet each other or something like that. But I'm not sure where's the line. I, but they seem to... That, like there's a working system, la, but it's just I'm not sure how... I can't tell. So this particular culture... Um, I, don't, I don't remember seeing it in all of the Ashara dojos that I've visited, but for sure I recognize it in... Kyokushin way of falling out actually so yeah uh, you go down the rank to greet the senior belt and then the next senior so on and so forth as you leave the class yeah it's kind of like giving acknowledgement uh. so and note what do you feel about the whole experience I think it'll be a good experience lah for anyone to just visit I mean may, may not be this specific dojo but I think a Japanese dojo to just experience like for me I've never so definitely looking forward to at least my first visit ever if I can like fit it into plans and all that yeah, yeah. yeah. autumn is a good time to go uh, in Japan temperature is just right not too hot not too cold the next best season is probably spring if you're planning to visit the dojo that we went to, which is in Chiba, Chose, uh, to be honest, is quite out of the way. Um, at the point of our visit, we were staying in Tokyo already. From Tokyo to the dojo location, it's probably about one and a half hours by drive. So, and by train, it's slightly longer, probably. But it's, it's a good experience. Uh, every, every time I'm in Tokyo, actually, uh, Fujioka Sensei's Dojo uh, is the destination where I will try to visit. There are other dojos in Tokyo, uh, for sure, and I've yet to visit them. And I've heard a lot of good things about the Tokyo dojos. But I specifically choose Fujioka Sensei's Dojo because he, I, I first saw what he does on the internet. He regularly posts his training footage on the internet. I like the way he organizes his class, his emphasis on the technical concepts of Ashara Karate. And it is not too tournament oriented. Or I don't think it's tournament oriented at all. And because of that, I get the sense of authenticity in terms of learning the Ashara art. And because it's not competitive, um, the vibe is generally quite easy going. Okay, so what do you think about the trip, our trip to Japan? Would you like to visit Japan someday? And how is the practice in Japan different from where you come from? So let us know in the comment box down below. And thank you for watching. We'll see you on the next video. Os.